Holy cow. So freaking pod. That's an episode. It's Cherry Doom. I'm Charles. And I'm Chad. Basically, we're just going to talk a little bit more about this book as a whole, how it's affected us, what we think about the ideas presented in it, and other stuff. And also, we're going to answer your questions. Your questions. We should introduce ourselves once again, because maybe somebody decides to listen to this first. So, I'm Charles. I am an English major slash commission artist who likes reading bad books. I am a... Cherry Doom. I'm a, I'm a lab tech, but I also have a, a lot of experience as a dominatrix. I also read and write erotic fiction. I'm a, I am Chad, and I don't really have any qualifications whatsoever. I don't have any BDSM experience. I was not like an English major, and that's my story. Okay, what is this book? We've been talking about this book like everyone knows what's going on. Let's slow it down and say exactly what the premise is. Someone said, quote unquote, what you'd find on the book jacket. Well, they could, you know, just fucking look it up, but I guess we can tell them for them. Maybe they don't want that in their search history. (sighs) (laughs) That's a pretty pussy thing to not want in your search history. (laughs) Sorry. I also also kind of parsed this question as like, what is this book? (laughs) What is this book? If you look at the book jacket, it's not going to tell you jack shit about the book that we haven't already said. We've explained it to quite... An extensive degree. <laughs> Go ahead, Cherry Doom. Yes, read us the book cover, the book flap jacket. When literature student Anastasia Steele goes to interview young entrepreneur Christian Gray, she encounters a man who is beautiful, brilliant, and intimidating. The unworldly, innocent Anna is startled to realize she wants this man, and despite his enigmatic reserve, finds she is desperate to get close to him. Unable to resist Anna's quiet beauty, wit, and independent spirit, mm. Gray admits he wants her too, but on his own terms. Shocked yet thrilled by Gray's singular erotic tastes, Anna hesitates, but for all the trappings of success, his multinational businesses, his vast wealth, his loving family, Gray is a man tormented by demons and consumed by the need to control. When the couple embarks on a daring, passionately physical affair, Anna discovers Christian Grey's secrets and explores her own dark desires. I had never read this, actually. <laughs> I think people are more confused about like the, who are the characters that we're talking about, so I, I made like a very small guide. Okay. And here it is. Anastasia is a frump lord. <laughs> she is the protagonist. She catches the interest of the bazillionaire Dom Christian Grey, and he's grooming her to be his sub. So Christian is grooming Anna to be his sub. Anna's best friend slash roommate is Kate. Kate, and she was the catalyst for Anna meeting Christian, for reasons that we explained in the first podcast, so you should go listen to it. Christian has a brother, also adopted, named Elliot. Elliot is dating Kate. Jose is somebody who has been quote-unquote friend-zoned. Uh, that's about it. All other characters, they don't really matter. If we mention them, it's just for context. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just for like the edification of people listening that don't know anything about BDSM, you're going to explain like the terms dom and sub more explicitly, right? Sure, dom means dominant. Uh, usually, the person who is in control of the situation. X is a the more powerful person giving orders or just you know physically controlling the person. There's a lot of nuance. Yeah, there is a lot of nuance. Like you could be like a, a dom who tops or. For instance, uh, I am not a dom. I'm more of a a top sadist. I like inflicting pain, but I'm really shitty at ordering people around. <laughs> I would call myself a bottom, but I would not necessarily put myself in the subcategory. Meaning that you are willing to be, say, t- having Paid stuff attention, having stuff done to me, but I don't necessarily like being like yeah. dominated. How did you hear about this book? What experience did you have prior to starting this podcast? For me, I'd heard about it and was mildly interested because of the BDSM element. Uh, then I heard that it was Twilight fan fiction. Then I heard that it was bad. Um, and then finally, I tried to read a couple chapters, but I just couldn't get through it because it was so bad. But it's really popular. One day, like at the at the height of its popularity at work, there were like three separate copies that, th- that three girls were reading in the break room, just like sitting out on the tables. <laughs> crazy the only thing that showed up in any in the break room when i was working years ago was uh twilight as for me i have this obsessive desire to read bad books and tear them apart i mean i read good books too and tear them apart that's why i'm an english major i'm like a lit crit major the first time i did like the bad book thing though i was like i found some romance novel when i was 15 or 16 it was about an archaeologist (laughs) 
Going to some <laughs> South American country to like excavate. Instead, he was excavating that pussy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Brushing it off with a very <laughs> delicate brush. <laughs> I've upset uh, many former friends who wanted to write novels, but I I meant well. I just I <laughs> happened to write a twenty eight page critique of your thing. That Dang. was very cruel. I I've done that a couple times. You should do that for mine. I would actually, but I don't want to kill you. Well, to be fair though, you're writing. <laughs> I'm already dead. <laughs> you're already dead. Your writing is actually not to the extent where I'd have to write twenty eight pages of critique. Probably not. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so I heard about Fifty Shades of Grey from, like, the media buzz in the background of, I'm sure, everybody's life, unless you live in a cabin in the woods. There was the Gilbert Gottfried reading that was great, and that was kind of what made me think about it more. What ultimately decided me to read the book was seeing how horrible the first chapter was and feeling the familiar pull of the bad book, inviting me to tear it apart. So that's, yeah, that's me. I heard about it basically the same way as Churls, just sort of the sort of ridiculous ubiquity of its presence in media like on like the today show and like uh, just sort of internet places media outlets that are just picking it up trying to discuss it in a way that's like is it good is it bad like uh in terms of um the content and like expressions of like female sexuality um that's generally how i heard about it uh and i had really didn't have any interest in reading it um although when i heard about it i was like i, I, I can't can't be all that bad like <laughs> seems to be doing positive things maybe but then this opportunity presented itself and i dove in head first and man i was probably right to stay out <laughs> why is it so popular i don't know if this is true the reason that it got published in print was due to its success in ebook form and the reason it was so successful in ebook form was because people could read it without showing anyone what they were reading. Right, like a Kindle, so there's no cover. Right, so there weren't, you know, any shitty romance covers, uh, super embarrassing, like a couple books that I have mm -hmm. uh, that I would definitely not ever <laughs> read in public. Um, but then it blew up and became more acceptable to read it in public. And so it's an interesting, I don't know what you'd call it, but like, you know, it became popular because it was easy to read discreetly, but then it became so popular that there was no need to be discreet about reading it. Perhaps you wouldn't call it like a cult classic. That's the wrong term. Well, maybe it's not, because it's not like men read it, I don't think. Um, except Chad, of course. Women are a cult. <laughs> the cult of females. <laughs> I have a question. Was it originally self-published by Yale James or did she ebook publish it through a publisher? His publishers do make ebooks, like just ebooks. Um that that by which I mean it went through an editor before it ever went to, to like the physical print. Right. I think it's safe stuff. to say it didn't go through an editor. <clears throat> it definitely did well, when it got printed, but it didn't change oh, yeah, very sure. much, which is interesting. That's kind of why I wondered. By the way, in the inside jacket of the uh you know with the copyright info yeah. The author published an earlier serialized version of this story online with different characters as Master of the Universe under the pseudonym Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. <laughs> that reminds me of my old AOL screen name, Blue Dragon 2135 LOL. And I mean, I think like the like uh, its popularity in ebook form also ties back into its general popularity. Like my understanding is that it was almost entirely word of mouth. Yeah, as yeah. it would be. So it would be sort of interesting to think about like why it caught on that way i think it's better to kind of just speculate rather than say like give statistics yeah. because i mean i think that the explanation that it that it was an ebook that you could hide is a pretty good one to get a little deeper with it let's unpack it a little as they say at school uh <laughs> it may have to do with some desire to be taken care of that like we that females <laughs> females that women sublimate there are upsides to the situation <laughs> can't believe I'm saying this. There are upsides to the situation with Christian because Anna doesn't he's have to worry about a number of things. Super like, rich. Yeah, he's super rich. He's like, you know, your sugar daddy. And in return for being the sugar daddy, he can exert his dominance over you as he has paid for it. And there's some kind of emotional material economy going on here. Because he's paid for it, she can give it up emotionally. Right? Yeah. Whatever. And she even worries a couple times in the book about being a hoe. And I'm quoting that directly. <laughs> I think that is a little bit masterful because it reflects how you, one may feel about their desires. Like, oh, like this is so fucked up. There are certain desires that I have where I think like, oh, this is so fucked up. Like, I hate myself. Yeah. And yet I want them fulfilled anyways. So the outward rejection of the innermost desires is there, but it feels 
it fulfills those innermost desires uh, that Anastasia may have or that Christian may have. I can't say I identify much with want to be taken care of because I am constantly terrified that I will be in debt to somebody. <laughs> it's far from a universal thing, but I think as far as like the subconscious goes, uh, I think you mm-hmm. touched on something important there too, Cheryl. The sort of idea of like forbiddenness which is still pretty, like it's it's just like a general sort of perception in society still and it definitely plays into that like pretty hardcore that might also be part of the appeal that it's like directly playing into that sort of idea yeah of course it's not really treating the material as like it's not treating the material either like as totally accepted or like blase or you know m- more disaffected I, I guess actually i want to pick you a little bit about that pick your brain i mean like are you sure that it's not disaffected because sometimes it kind of seems like it is i mean like she's shocked and all but but i think that that's not i think that's a function of how bad of a writer she is and probably <laughs> how many editors it probably passed through and i know that's a pretty meta explanation but like yeah i mean the way that anna is characterized explicitly i'm not necessarily talking about the narrative prose um per se she is constantly like fraught with sort of internal conflict over her feelings and then she has all these like dreams that are portrayed as being dark and i know that is also part of it too like twilight did the mm-hmm. same thing and i mean there is like definitely an appeal and that's sort of like oh this yeah that's is that's it. kind of what i want to attack on to do you i mean we all have an opinion about this but like do you feel that the book is saying that this kind of an arrangement is all right hmm. i mean it would be really hard to say that it's not saying that it's all right i mean that definitely kind of goes into the next question yeah, yeah let's, then let's handle the next question so let's talk about uh bdsm in the book versus real life and if you don't know i mean i i swear to god we must have mentioned it earlier bdsm stands for bondage domination submission masochism or sadism masochism? actually yeah, please help please educate bondage me. domination discipline submission sadism masochism so it's BDDSM. BDDSSM. BDDSSM. My biggest problem with this book is the separation of BDSM play in real life, fantasy versus reality. There are stories which present uh, aspects of BDSM as part of a fantasy, like any story with power play, imbalance, teacher, student, commanding officer, enlisted, doctor, patient, rich person, poor person. These are all, f- you know, okay, except for that last one. These are all fine in fantasy, but if they occur in real life, they can be extremely problematic. I mean, not saying that they aren't. There's always, because of the power balance there's always you know a question of consent and coercion it's a very very fine line yeah it's fun to think about in fiction but in real life it has serious consequences right that is why you would play in like a scene you wouldn't actually be a doctor and a patient or whatever what have you right exactly this book tries to present bdsm in a more realistic form there are contracts and actual discussions of the kinks etc basically he outlines his rules for her behavior like you will maintain a strict physique keep your pussy shaved (laughs) you won't drink or do anything that might embarrass me even though she's not supposed to tell anyone about their relationship so how's she gonna embarrass anyone they're not even gonna know it tries to put in like a consensual heavily regulated bdsm relationship but it also has elements of an unhealthy fantasy type relationship where christian stalks anna you know tracks her phone comes and swoops her up when she's drunk and does all this really questionable stuff and i wonder if mixing those two things is okay i may just have a really poor opinion of the public but i think it could be confusing portraying what is okay and what's not do you think that people would be able to separate these two things out no i don't that's a problem like i think that sort of awareness comes with not necessarily study but either experience or some like study like theories about like intersectionality and stuff so the majority of people probably reading this book are not to be like sort of classicist or just like pretty quote unquote average middle class where it's like they have pretty sheltered in a sense lives where they wouldn't necessarily think of any of the problems that are coming up i mean that's one of the reasons that there's so many other problems with media in general this just is the same thing. I find to a great degree there is like some intersectionality to this. I'm strongly reminded of experience that I have had. There is this perception, especially with people who are like not experienced with women or whatever group you want to say it is, doesn't matter. You have this perception of it because the media has taught you like what people 
like or what you think that they like. The reality is completely different. Yeah. I can give an example about, thinking about it makes me fucking sick. I think it's that Return of Kings website. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have a couple articles about like how all women want to be dominated. All women like rough sex. Here's how to make a feminist bitch your sex slave and then <laughs> utterly humiliate her by telling her that you hate her feminist right. dumb cunt, whatever. You know, it's funny that you bring it up because I feel like this too is a really good example of the line of fantasy and reality being blurred. It would be fine to have those fantasies. To conflate that with reality is yeah. you are insanely stupid. The sad part of that is like, I don't even think you really have to be insanely stupid. I think you just have to be kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really just have to lack self-awareness and empathy or sympathy for other people. I disagree. I mean, about the self-awareness. I think it's lacking the awareness of others. That inability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes is really it. what does well, it. Well, yeah, but that's sort of what I mean. Like the ability to step back. I think you have to be sort of self-aware where to to have like that sort of empathy to step into someone else's shoes because hmm. otherwise you're just solipsist yeah i suppose so it's so <laughs> depressing all right anyways yeah. should we move on how has this affected the culture i mean obviously people talk about this all the time like there's it's like in the media like you know oh the 50 shades of gray movie has finally been cast it makes entertainment news and stuff one thing that i can say definitely is uh, sex toys when i go to a sex shop there are like many companies that sell specific branded items to appeal to the readers of the book there was one that was like a little bundle that had all three books and then there was a tie the mask and then the handcuffs like the actual items that mask was not used as fetish play in the book was it used like to hide her identity so they go to a masquerade ball and there's like a lady auction it's more of like a class signifier more than anything else i think it might be maybe you know ownership horror kind of yeah but he was wearing a mask too I, all right yeah well, so i don't know I, I wish that was real but it's not um. <laughs> at one point the author saw eyes wide shut yeah they have the tie that's like a thing you can buy which it's just a fucking gray tie you can get that anywhere but you know you got to get the specific one i think i saw a couple of canes and, and writing crops but all of them were like very generic there was like identical ones that right. were cheaper and not branded but like people want this oh i've got to get the 50 shades version because that's, so... that's the because that's the right one Ugh. that's the one that is acceptable from the book and then yeah one, one instance is um this article that i found while i was looking up tie me up tuesdays because i didn't oh, yeah. someone mentioned it and i didn't know what I'm it so was i'm so curious to know what you're gonna say about this it was just this weird article about uh, how to broach the subject of bondage with your girlfriend and um well if you're going to use a tie don't use the flimsy one you wear to your boring cubicle job get something specially made for this kind of stuff something christian gray would wear if you're unfamiliar with 50 shades of gray christian gray is a self-made billionaire and bondage god good vibrations has a gray tie from the sports sheet sex and mischief line in the exact style christian gray sports in the book it's not made for slumping over your office desk the snm gray tie is made with the perfect fabric for tying up and sleeping with someone sexy oh yeah i mean let me see what it's made out of 100 percent polyester <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Great. No, but I wonder if it has to do with the structure of the tie. Like a cheap tie, you can peel apart if you take off the label. I wonder if that's it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I doubt it. It looks like a normal fucking tie. How to much me. you want to fucking bet it's a normal tie? <laughs> Almost certainly, it's just a marketing gimmick. Yeah, Obviously, uh, but yeah, it's like it's like don't use your boring tie that you have. Get this <laughs> fantasy tie that's yeah. you know. This is the correct tie to use. I'm uh, confused. A paisley tie would be much more interesting than a solid gray one. I agree with that. Exactly. Much more festive. <laughs> There's one line that I just noticed that I need to talk about because it makes me mad. The thing is, most women want to try bondage and enjoy being dominated by a partner they trust. If somebody reads this and skims over it, the thing is, most women want to buy, yeah. try, try do yeah. bondage and enjoy being dominated. No. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 that, no. That ties back in exactly with the sort of thing that we were just talking about. Like, oh, it those ties sorts of in? <laughs> <laughs> Those sorts of assumptions, sort of internalized, unchecked things. Somebody one day had shown me there was this like little porn video series that was like showing how, oh, like women do like this. They want to talk about it. They want to get personal. And it's like, that's fine. You know, a, a sample group of women is not all women. Like not everybody's sexual taste is like that. It made me really exactly. angry. Yeah, that's... And it was used in the context of like, why don't you like these things? Well, and that's like a big problem. And this is a little outside of the milieu of just like this podcast, but that is just like a large problem 
in general with media, that's sort of conflation. And it's a big logical fallacy that people like to use when they're yeah. discussing things where it's like one for the whole. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, you can't do that. One person doesn't get to speak for everybody else, no matter, no, even if they are quote unquote representative. I just find it interesting. That's something that should be used to liberate you to say like, yes, like this book does exist. People can be like that, can be turned around to say, you aren't like this. People are like this. Therefore, you are the outside. Yeah. Okay, something else in this article, she talks about how once someone t tried bondage with her and like, they did something embarrassing and then, uh, oh, he, he didn't tie it tight enough and she slipped out. She laughed and like, it ruined the whole experience. He was emasculated. He was emasculated and like, he had to masturbate in the bathroom and it was so horrible for that him. That was a really weird line. <laughs> My friend George was heavily sexually humiliated. Here's what you should do for bondage! <laughs> My friend George was drunk and shared something he probably wouldn't have shared normally. Let me share it with you. Wait, was, was he drunk? Was he drunk? Maybe. It's, it was basically what she was saying. Like, I don't. They make it out to be like this sort of fun thing that you can try, but like, don't make any mistakes, like yeah. tying a thing too loose, or you'll ruin everything. And don't discuss how to make it better. Just do it right the first time. It's not how it should work. I mean, there should no. be communication. And there used to be a lot of communication. There's trial and error and discussion. It's. I just like. Most newcomers to BDSM, I've found, they often don't realize the amount of discussion you have to undergo is tremendous. Yep. By the way, this article is on sex with emily.com and it's called try bondage and tie her up so if you want to look at it look for that <laughs> <laughs> this art kind of article is very common you'll find this of sort course. of thing like buy a buy a tie, buy a blindfold and uh under the bed restraint system to make your boring bed transform into a bondage playground your boring bed is gonna become a bondage bed <laughs> Oh, and there's a very, very small line at the bottom. Also, who said men should have all the fun tying her up? If you're a woman and want to tie your partner up, go for it. Shouldn't that be like the first yeah, thing? Yeah, that should be like the first thing. <laughs> I'm sure you can find a way to convince him to try it. As a lady dom, I hate the fucking machismo bullshit. Like, you know, you have to be the one who ties up the lady. And I actually think that uh, subs are very strong and they're the one taking all the pain and discomfort. They're the ones who ultimately are kind of in charge because they can safe word it any time. Yes. So there's like nothing emasculating about it. Right. Even if emasculation is, you know, part <laughs> of the fantasy. <laughs> with the whole article, like it, as as we like as you mentioned with the actual URL, like it was an article written by a woman. So like these are all basically it, it's hard to say whether it was written from this perspective, like the way that it was written in terms of male dominance and everything like that because that's like the expected norm or if well, it's something that she's kind of internalized. I mean, that's sort of a I think it's the internalized thing. I think at the end of the day we all need to realize even you me charles and charity and chad need <laughs> yeah. to realize that we are all product of our culture yep so to some extent these things are like really inescapable yeah i might be the one who cannot escape the most <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i definitely buy into a lot of the things that i am ashamed of buying into i mean once you become aware it's basically a very you have to be very thoughtful um, it's so right. depressing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of people who are like too ashamed to do anything, like completely paralyzed because they know that they are a product of their time and place. The thing is, as long as you're aware of it, that's really it. That's all you need to do. Don't be ashamed. Just be yourself, but just don't, you know, awareness will help you not hurt anybody in the process, including yourself. But one last note about ties. <laughs> I have a Where's Waldo tie. Imagine how fun that Ooh. would be. What? <laughs> Oh, that'd be great. You get really bored, you just look for Waldo. If, yeah, if somehow it was like a blindfold and you could somehow see it. A, in, lighted inside. I'm just imagining like Chad being like, all right, listen, I'm going to hide. You have to find me and then I'll do it. <laughs> There's this extra aspect to it. Or you hide the sub who's I hide a million other me's, a million clones I've prepared especially for this occasion. <laughs> Just some other things about how it's affected the culture. There's a Fifty Shades of Grey lingerie line. Uh, we oh just boy. watched the commercial for it. It's by Kapal. That's the company. Yes. And it's like basically Anna or the person portraying Anna is like in some high-waisted granny panties, lacy granny panties, uh, writhing around on a bed with the mask on. And then she gets up and goes to the bathroom and there's a t the tie on the counter and a little envelope that says Anastasia Steele and she opens it. Can, can I say what it says? Yeah. You! are mine <laughs> like with periods yeah and then she like she she like looks at it and then she gets a fancy pen and she writes oh my <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was like and right then she the walks away and and the last shot is of her like throwing off the mask it's yeah i don't i don't think the note was written by christian i think it was written by el james that's why the punctuation is so bad oh my <laughs> <laughs> Oh my 
my god. There's all these these underwears, uh, including we mentioned uh, the one that she gets bought after she wakes up from being drunk. I believe that's episode five, chapter <laughs> yeah. five. There's a Fifty Shades of Grey musical. I it seems to be about. I can't, I couldn't figure out what it was exactly. If it was like adaptation of the story, or if it was just about these middle aged ladies who were reading it, or both. Hmm. I think the the both option would be pretty interesting. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I, I feel like I don't want to know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of do because I feel like it's definitely poking fun at it. Yeah. Those are two things that could be really grating musicals and Fifty Shades of Grey. Like I just, <laughs> it could be so bad. It could be so good, but it's more likely to be bad. Someone on Twitter mentioned that they were thinking about going to see it and I wish I'd replied to them uh. saying that yes they should and report back um, but I did not because I was probably asleep at the time. I think I did reply to oh, them good. and I think I said something like if you want to be if you want to torture yourself like Aww. by continuing to <laughs> follow this stupid thing like if you would like if you would like to dom yourself please attend this musical is it more popular than Twilight? I mean, not, not, obviously it's not as much of a, as a phenomenon in the like total media force sense, but like, has it outsold Twilight? It's outsold Harry Potter hmm. in the UK at least, so probably. That's probably worth noting. It it, yeah. it has outsold Harry Potter. I'm assuming that includes the ebook sales too, not just the print copies. Yeah, okay. definitely. How has it affected us personally? Uh, I don't think I have anything to say. It hasn't affected me personally at all. Except that I'm doing this podcast. I, unfortunately, uh, due to various social anxiety problems, I've been out of the scene so long that if I, the BDSM kink thing, that if I were to suddenly show show up again, I would not be able to explain my about two year long absence now. It would just be super awkward. Unfortunately, I can't say like how it's affected the kink scene, though I would be very interested to know. But just personally, though. Just personally, I do have a friend who said uh, that it was like a little offensive, like, hey, that's my thing. You can't just take it like that and make it super popular. And that's very much how, like, like I would say the recent nerd culture getting popular and, you know, nerds being like, you can't do that. Uh, we were oppressed and now you're making it great and you can't be... You're riding on the coattails of my oppression. Yeah, this is my space. You can invade it. And I sort of understand that. And Trills, I know you have a lot more to say about that. And the other thing is that it definitely makes me examine my own uh, writing style. That's something it did for me, too. Definitely makes me look at what I write and, like, think, oh, God, I did the thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't write erotica like you do, but, like, it definitely has made me think, like, don't do anything she's doing. <laughs> I actually pay attention a lot more to like the dynamics between men and women in my writing because that's mm. something like I, I definitely would play out those princess in a tower type things in my fiction. <laughs> oh, stop it! So to go on with how it is affected me personally, as for like the scene which you talk about, I used to have a roommate who she had a membership to this fetish club. I'm curious about this because I, for, sure. as far as I know, there's nothing like this in in my town, and I'm sound. I was like really. Uh... Well, you can. You guys, uh, I don't want to I mean, say which city. Yeah, I, I mean, in. you know, just say it off. Like, was it like super fancy and like, uh, or it was is, it kind it of? Was, it was a private club. The way that you get to go is either you get to come as a guest with another <laughs> member, which is like what I would do a couple times and with other uh -huh. friends as well, or you can be sponsored by somebody. And I actually just now got told that somebody will sponsor me if I want to do it. Mm. So that's interesting. Is it like because most places I went were like you know at someone's house or no? Something it's a like bar. That. It's like it's an actual bar. It's it's a like that's all they do? Mm, I mean, they have events. They've got a DJ, like, stuff like that. Uh, but I mean, like, nobody nobody is allowed inside ever, except unless they're a member. Members plus guests. It's not like they have, it's not like a bar that has, like, a fetish night. It's, like, exclusively. Yeah. Have you never heard of one of these places, Charidium? It's, like, like an exclusive members only, like, fetish club. That's how I they didn't, operate. I thought they didn't exist. <laughs> no, they definitely exist. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's just because I, I don't live in a large enough town, which I would have thought that I did because I, yeah. I like to think I live in a cool town. I mean, I live in a pretty cool enough one. There's a thing about this, though. There's an aspect to it, and this is true of many exclusive clubs. There's an aspect of classicism to it. Yeah. I actually don't know if I experienced that when I was there. Maybe a little bit. Well, I'm not saying that all of them are like that, but many of like the exclusive clubs that are set up are actually for like rich people in I will like, say that this certain club cities. It um it has other nights like a like a stand up comedy night and stuff and I do think that the general populace is allowed in then but whenever any fetish okay. stuff is on the table it's like members only and like they don't allow photos they try to do everything to protect you if you're gonna do kinky stuff okay anyway that said I never it's funny because when I 
when I didn't have any exposure at all to BDSM. And I was just kind of like, oh, like, hanging out with my roommate. <laughs> now, all that was to say that I've sort of kind of entered the scene, not really, kind of like touched with it. But I don't actively pursue it because I'm kind of like, I'm honestly still kind of a mess, just like in all ways. And I don't know what I want. So yeah, <laughs> this, this book was a helpful discussion tool because it is really ridiculous. And it makes a good talking point with the person that I would consider doing stuff like that with. Like to say like, oh, ha, ha like they did a dumb thing. But like, what do you think of? And to, to talk about like the, you can't take my thing away like that. Like don't write on my oppression. That's something that gets restated in a lot of communities with disenfranchised people or just any kind of exclusivity. Because you get into, like, a contest, like, who's the most depressed? Like, oppressed, excuse me, not depressed. Who's the most BDSM? Like, but, yeah, like, it's that's just straight up elitism. It is elitism, and it's not really what that's about. Like, it's it shouldn't matter if you enter it because of Fifty Shades of Grey or because of your fetishes. Like, you just... Newbies can get punished in the, the blazes of BDSM hell if they're not serious about it. Yep. BDSM hell is a real place, and you will go there if you enjoy... You will go! <laughs> if you enjoy Fifty Shades or Twilight. <laughs> Brother! You may go on a journey like this and learn that you actually just like bad Twilight fanfiction, but, like, that's not a sin <laughs> if you do it mindfully. Like, it's fine to like those things. So, to the hardcore leather daddies and doms and subs, <laughs> I just say, like, you know, just let people explore themselves. Maybe it could turn out that these people, it may be for a dumb reason, but maybe they will find out that they're just as hardcore as you. The BDSM community can be extremely elitist and um, catty, which is one of the reasons I'm hesitant to try to get back into it, just because, like, I just want to hit people. I just want to hit people. Don't need all this drama and, like, gossip and shit. Yeah, that is not cool. Okay, so now we are going to answer reader questions! Listener. I mean, listener questions! <laughs> well, we're reading the book for them, we so are they're, like... The book for them. So they're readers. Sort of readers. Readers by proxy questions. Vicarious readers. First question is from Shallow Throat. They did a lot of questions. Okay, so the first five questions are from Shallow Throat. And uh, number one, why is bra size the first thing you go for when thinking of potential questions people could ask? Did you secretly just really want to talk about bras and boobs? Uh, excuse me, Shallow Throat. If you don't think about boobs 24-7, leave this planet because you're not a human being. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, am I right the, or am I right? <laughs> when I was trying to think of like, when I was begging people to ask questions, I was like, it doesn't have to be about, you know, BDSM. It could just be anything. We really need questions for people to ask. I was just trying to like think of what's like some weird, creepy question that someone might ask. Uh, bra size. <laughs> Although I was not aware of that context, we d we have talked about bra size in the podcast. We've talked about bra size before because um, when Taylor yeah. buys her the bra, I, that was the first thing I was very curious about. Is like, yeah. what's up with her titties? <laughs> if 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 he's curious about that, I would just say product of culture. Like, <clears throat> absolutely, that's what but, I was kind of trying to say. Like, yeah, yeah. It might even just be like being human. I don't even know if it's a culture thing. Probably, mm, it's cultural. It's definitely cultural. It's it's like what sorts it of it just goes to show you, doesn't it? Yeah, it's what aspects of the human body are fetishized at any particular yeah. time by any particular group of people. I suppose. I guess. Well, okay. For example, in Japan, in like like Heian era Japan, their standard standard of beauty and like black teeth. Yeah, black teeth, uh, very small eyebrows, completely white face, and then later on, uh, do you know like what? for like geishas and stuff what the actual like the most erotic zone that you could view at that time period is was. it the like, back of the neck yeah exactly the back of the yeah. neck like they didn't care at all about bust or, or like hips or anything it was back of the neck and the kimonos were explicitly designed to get rid of all those features <laughs> but surely when the clothes come off i mean secondary There's no way to know. characteristics uh, well i mean i've seen some dirty japanese paintings I've, I've, we've all seen the lady <laughs> in the octopus but that might just be like erogenous uh, <laughs> zones i mean it doesn't necessarily mean that they have well like, that's a what fetish. i that's kind of what i was getting at like it is an erogenous so aside yeah. from the weird fetish fetishization but I, I meant in relation to like why would you think of that first i mean it's like in the u.s it's a big like aspect of selling sexuality I think of it, first cause I love it isn't necessarily the same in other places <laughs> so question two again from shallow throat bdsm has never really appealed to me but i've never really tried it either do you think it's something that you instinctively know you are turned on by or is it something you discover you like after experiencing some of it my answer to this question is that people are different sometimes i'm someone i'm close to explain that they've had known that they were BDSM inclined since they're like four. People are different. I would say that I'm in that latter category. Like you experience something and you're like, okay, well, I should figure out what is up with me. Sexual exploration is different for everyone. It's a different question to answer, which is why I feel that to you guys. Say what you want. For me, that's kind of both, maybe. Like, like I sort of just decided to get into it on a whim. I looked around to like different groups in the area and it was, it was never like something that I knew like explicitly, but it had always been something that like in the back of my mind 
mind. Yeah. And then sort of as I got into it, I, I don't know if this is real or if it's just me looking back and justifying things that I would do younger, like when I would look for opportunities to slap boys on the face or just like kind of be a bitch <laughs> for no reason. I think anyone, if you have like a fetish, like you just, it is, it's like ever present. It's yeah. ubiquitous. Even if you can't name it or if you're a child and you don't know what the hell's going on. And it, it might just be a, you know, just maybe I'm just a bitch and I'm <laughs> trying to find a healthy way to, to, to let it well, out. Well, but then this is this is a good outlet for it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't appeal to you, then if you want to try it, then that's fine. If you don't, then you don't. I mean, yeah. it's not something you have to, like, you know, trial by fire or anything. If it interests you... <laughs> trial by fire. <laughs> um. <laughs> like, if you want to do it, then you definitely want to do it and if you don't then you don't and if you're not sure then you know you try it and see if you like it that's the same philosophy you should use when you're trying new foods i agree shallow throat question number three romance novels always seem to be the butt of jokes for being trashy and poorly written do you know of any actually good ones that was a grammar check on you (laughs) mr or miss bonus points if they are in some way similar to but obviously better than Fifty Shades of Grey. Well, I don't know if you know this, but there's Fifty Shades of Grey Plus. What? I'm just kidding. This is totally a joke. You can edit. You can totally edit that out. <laughs> uh, I won't. Um, oh no. <laughs> oh no. Uh, my answer is anything Cherry Doom has written. Ha ha ha! Just kidding, guys. I've read almost none of her writing. <laughs> Taste is really subjective, especially as it comes to erotica. This is what I've found. So I've had people say like, oh, this is good. And I read it and I thought like, this is shit. I mean, while the writing was not grammatically wrong or anything, it might just be good to troll the Terotica. <laughs> I don't remember if it's .net org or gov or whatever, edu, and see what you like. There's categories. They've organized everything into categories. Yeah, the- the thing with um especially like actual straight up romance novels like harlequin romance or like any of the books you'd actually find in romance a lot of them are the and i don't like mean to dane on the writer's talent they're writing in a pulp genre so it's like they have particular points that they need to hit and they're very formulaic so you really should just try to sample a lot of stuff and see what appeals to you that's my yeah, advice i agree my tastes run very specific, and though I've read a lot of erotica, I can't really say that it would be appealing to everybody. Yeah. For instance, um, for a while, I was very specifically looking for gay historical romance set in World War II. And by gay, we mean... Uh, male, male. Male, male. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that's sort of very... I mean, I have slightly broader, but I mean, I'm mainly interested in male male stuff. I can give you recommendations for that. Not sure if you want them. Plenty of ladies like that sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm sure some uh, gay males like it too, but you know, it's, I don't know what kind of, you know, uh, listenership we have. Question four. Do you spell gray with an E or an A? Does the other way look weird to you? A looks weird, E looks correct. Uh, It's interchangeable in my opinion. They're both technically Mm. correct. I spell depending on my mood. I also (laughs) spell depending on my mood. It's only if I want to be like bad to the bone because E is correct and A is weird. Question number five. If you designed a Fifty Shades of Grey video game, what would it be like? Specifically what? What? I mean, did, did they put that in just to make me angry? Well, they put it at the beginning, though, instead of the end. No, but I like the middle. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, technically, this isn't... I'm not mad anymore. If you designed this Fifty Shades of Grey video game, what would it be like? Specifically, what would the plot be, if not just a retelling of the novel? And what genre would it be? Well, my answer is, I think the aesthetic of Heavy Rain and Fifty Shades of Grey are perfect for each other. In that they're both, like, boring and turgidly written? Yeah, and, like, just think of, like, the <laughs> quick time events, like, if you are yeah. if you get to be Christian and you're just like, like, you're pressing the thing really hard. I'd love to, like, turn the, like, left stick to try and interview Christian Grey. Like, you, you mess it up. Like, are you get? Oh, no, I can't ask that question. Yeah, like, all the scenes with Anna, like, all the quick time icons just, like, are red, 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 she falls down. You just, yeah, you just have to, like, keep lifting a drink to your lips in order to like get smashed <laughs> at the bar like, so would being so would being clumsy actually make it that's a successful thing that's so, successful so if you fail that quick time yeah she walks out perfectly fine and they never talk again <laughs> and christian great. gray is not impressed yeah christian gray yeah, doesn't like, go in hmm, for those people that special. can stand on their own two feet there's little clips of his face frowning every time he <laughs> yeah. right ah perfect we, will we get the same voice actors so well, we have like some mm-hmm. w- weird pronunciation for Christian Grey. Yeah, like Anna. Christian Anna's Grey. Like, cra- <laughs> Christian Grey. And Anna can be like French like, eh, why specifically? Harry, show me the, what BDSM tools I have at my disposal. <laughs>
By the way, Nor- Nom and Jade is. Nom and Jade. He's my Nom favorite Jade. character in that game. Mine too. <laughs> yeah, he's the best. I would do a uh, Custer's Revenge style Atari. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> where Christian has to... Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what the actual premise would be, but that's that's the style I want to see it in. <laughs> hmm. Maybe Anna has to like trip over various things to get to Christian. Yeah. Uh, at which point there's a, a scene of him spanking her. Yeah. She has to walk over slightly uneven floor tiles. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> oh, her, it could be like badgering roommate. Oh, okay. Well, you said Custer's Revenge. What if it were like ET style? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> An ET style Atari game where you just have no idea what's going on. Like this is how we feel with the book. You're just wandering around. That actually aimlessly. would be a really great analogy for how this book is. <sighs> Someone make it for me. <laughs> Here are my answers. I have three. The last one is dumb, but the first two are okay. So the first one I'd really like to see would be an adventure game, like in the style of, you know, old, like Maniac Mansion, T- Day of the Tentacle, which Anna must navigate a bizarre Lynchian nightmare scape that moves from, you know, like Portland, Seattle into sort of a Borges-esque, Murakami-esque uh, other space with like hallways, impossible spaces, um, dimensions like that with uh, heavy, heavy elements of body horror a la like Takashi Miike or David Cronenberg like video oh, drone man. Ridiculous. <laughs> and that's secretly about her budding sexuality secretly quote unquote and like the repulsion <laughs> attraction assi- excitement that uh, a lot of people feel when those sorts of feelings are awakening because you know Anna is basically a child turning into a teenager in the book so it's thematically relevant but then of course at the end the secret plot twist is that it's really just the ending from the second variety of Philip K. Dick short story in that she's actually Anna's actually just a robot which is why she's so bad at being a human she has highly advanced ai and actually like the whole sexual awakening thing is really just that she was becoming sentient slash sapient and then achieving rampancy in the sense of like marathon the marathon games which are like precursors of halo sorry for all the name dropping and then also the correct title of the second variety i think so oh yeah you're right i thought the way that book turned out i thought it was a much later variety anyway uh i think the way that that book works the varieties are getting smaller like it's like fourth variety third variety second variety first variety it's it's, i don't remember exactly so yeah like second variety ending so she's also there to exterminate all humans and then at the very end (laughs) she gets into a rocket and goes to humanity's secret moon base just like in the second variety spoilers Spoilers. Spoilers. The second one is a, a Christian Grey life simulator slash dating sim. So I guess sort of this is sort of like Persona, but without RPG elements, in which you have to balance the elements of your job, kind of like in the Wall Street game, the very old Wall Street game, and your secret oh sex life. Oh my god! <laughs> secret se- sex life, like uh, True Love '95, Tokimeki Memorial, where you have to like min max your stats to be able to get with all these partners. So the main plot is that you want to craft the perfect sub while also balance becoming the richest man in the world. So there's multiple endings, multiple potential partners, and this is a special note I included, including a clone of yourself, either same gender or swapped as a potential <laughs> sub. Yeah, something for everybody. Oh, True Love is that game I was trying to think of, I think. Is that the one where you're a student and it's, you're not a student, but you're like, you have to plan out your schedule and there's like a, a girl who's secretly an idol and one girl who's like a Lolita? Probably. That's like every dating sim, honestly. Sorry, have you actually played this game? I might be overplaying my hand here. No, I've never played any game ever. I don't know what anime is. I don't know what video games are. What is are. a game? <laughs> What's anime? Is this anime? Is this anime? In the words of Jeff Gerstmann, anime is for jerk so the last one is just a really simple it's a 2d platformer that's bdsm themed but like the collectibles are for like points or like whips and ties and handcuffs and dildos and then levels are just based on chapters from the book so like the first level is just anna jumping around a quote-unquote sterile modern office building that's quote-unquote all slate and steel as she makes her way to christian's (laughs) office for an interview number six if you had a sexual superpower what would it be and i think i speak for everybody in the podcast (laughs) when i say to never let anyone touch us I agree. Agreed. Next question. If Looney Tunes did a parody of Fifty Shades of Grey, which tunes would be cast for the main roles? I think Bugs Bunny and Drag. Chad, Chad, Chad. Well, see, I think, and this is not necessarily true, I think that Bugs Bunny's like gender slash sexuality is way too fluid to fit into this book. <laughs> he's too he's too liberated. He could be Kate. <laughs> yes, I exactly. Think, I, I think that as a parody, though, that would be... Yeah, no. Well, I think Daffy and Elmer. Daffy and Elmer in every role. Just imagine imagine like a dom-sub relationship between Daffy and Elmer, but as Daffy and Elmer. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, Elmer Fudd is clearly Christian because he's like predatory. I'm going to say Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam. Bugs Bunny is Anna and Yosemite Sam. Ooh, that 
Anastasia Steele, she's so sexy. <laughs> That's just like the general uh, attitude of yelling and hopping around. I don't fuck Anna. Shit, Anna. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> shit, Anna. Okay, number eight. Last from Shallow Throat. How many words can you make from the letters in Holy Cast of Freaking Pod? I don't know if you mean anagrams that we can make or individual words or one big word. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably an- just anagrams. Well, I use the anima- anagram jan- generator and that you Google as the first result and it it says that it's too many characters. But I, So I took it by <laughs> Holy Cast and then I did So Freaking Pod. So an anagram of Holy Cast and an anagram So Freaking Pod. And then I picked my favorite, which is Class Ho Toy Naked for Pig. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. That's so perfect. I know. I love Anagram. I wish I could have done more, but I just, you know, the character element. From Mike, do you think that you'll start to unironically enjoy Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> like developing a sort of Stockholm Syndrome that it turns out that the book is so bad it's good? Having read all the books, I read all the books. I read all the books. I will say, <laughs> I, I did get very interested in, in knowing the outcome of certain things like storyline wise, but I never got emotionally invested in the characters. Christian is adopted. I'm spoiling this because it's a meta episode. And that story is kind of interesting, but only because of how like fucked up it is. Like, you know, because it's compelling, it's sad. And then the author ruins it by making it the reason that he is a dom, which is really offensive. That is really generalizing practitioners of BDSM and enjoyers and to say like, he likes this because he was heavily fucked up and abused. That's not okay. I already find myself playing devil's advocate for a lot of like strange wording or bizarre behavior. I, you, you will often hear me trying to explain something that is just patently ridiculous. And I feel like that might be a Stockholm Syndrome symptom, perhaps. It could be, but we also need to do that just to like, make the podcast more than like, this book is poop. <laughs> that's true and i do i do kind of look forward to reading the next chapter just because i i love underlining it and making notes about it as far as characters concerned they can go die yeah it's really more like a game than it is like a exactly yeah, yeah. will i ever un- unironically enjoy 50 shades uh nope and i never will um, honestly the most fun i have with this book is just discussing it on the podcast and laying bare its many faults and crimes it's otherwise just unbearable to read and like people have said characters are just they don't exist and you can't relate to them. So there's nothing to enjoy at all, period. Yep. Okay, so we have not a question, but some feedback from Seer. I hope I'm saying that right. C-I-E-R. Most recent episode was great. Please keep up the good work. Smiley face. Churl's clip about the complaining made me laugh. <laughs> I really don't want to boss y'all around, but I do feel like you guys brought up the quality this time around. Thanks again for what you do. You've taken a real hit for the team by reading this book. Well, Sierra, I'm assuming that by, by team... Sierra, that you mean humanity, in which case I have this to say, humanity will never recover from this blow. Oh, you say you don't want to boss us around, but what if we want to be bossed around? What if that didn't think of that? Think again. Um, and that thing you said, Chad, makes me feel like Fifty Shades of Grey is like a piece of Lavos evolving us into a different forms, <laughs> but it will be our downfall. Um, I don't understand that reference. It's from Chrono Trigger. Yeah, Chrono Trigger. Oh. We should just, why are we... Why yeah. are we doing Why this? Why are we doing this? Let's, let's all just go play Chrono Trigger. Let's just all play <laughs> Chrono Trigger. Let's, let's, let's play <laughs> Chrono Trigger. Let's individually. Hey, you know, some people may have n- maybe coming to this podcast with no knowledge of video games. Yeah, it, it's funny, <laughs> but we are, I think the way that we know each other is mostly by video yeah. games, so they have to deal with it. I think the majority yeah. of what we say is so reference free, except for like the things that I say that it doesn't matter. <laughs> Making references for some people, that is, it will help connect them to the podcast. So we, yeah. we thank you for your presence stuff so from rob p my question is what are your thoughts on the film adaptation of 50 shades of gray and how should it be done my personal thought is that they should just literally throw out the entire story and characterizations of every character in the book keep only the names and create a brand new story otherwise i can only see the film as miserable softcore porn chad you're the one with the first uh, oh okay i'm just always assuming i don't go first because usually it's girls i'm gonna kill you (laughs) no just kidding go ahead (laughs) my idea for the 50 shades of gray movie the first 10 minutes completely normal Anna and Kate, like Anna's rushing out the door as Kate's like, I don't know, spilling coffee all over herself in the table in her sickness saying like, I'm sorry, Anna, I interview. She gets to the meeting and then after that concludes, you just have her tripping out the door and the screen fades to white, perhaps implying that Anna has died. Then when it fades back in, it's sort of like panning over tundra e winter wilderness and it just becomes a sequel to The Grey. None of the events, characters, plot points or dialogue from the book ever show up again. That's my first idea. We see a figure, a great figure, coming out of the snowy. It's Liam Neeson covered in wolf pelts. <laughs> Amazing. Somehow we still fit the title back in. He looks directly at the camera and says, this really is 
Fifty Shades of Grey, and then, <laughs> and then the rest of the movie proceeds. I was going to say that 50 ghosts show up and Liam Neeson has to kill them all. Glass fists aren't going to save him this time. So it's a sequel to a sequel to 13 ghosts. Yeah, now oh there's 50. Yeah. <laughs> so my second idea, even though there's problems with all three of these directors, especially in terms of like their attitudes towards women, mm-hmm. someone like David Fincher, David Lynch, David, Cronen- David Cronenberg uh, should direct it, um, or like Jim Jarmusch or Spike Jones. Basically somebody weird that would completely ignore the fan base and reshape the source material into whatever they want to do to make a good movie sort of like kubrick with the shining yeah exactly as for casting daniel craig is all roles except kate who is jude law and then also martin sheen is ray uh and i see he's actually secretly his character from apocalypse now (laughs) (laughs) i like that if you want to see a good uh david cronenberg movie about fetish uh crash Yep. Not the one that won Best Picture no. for some reason, but the one from the 90s starring David Spader? Uh, I believe so, yes. In which people jerk off and have sex uh, after they have car crashes because it turns them on. <laughs> so I said I liked Rob P's idea because it was it kind of reminded me of like superhero movies or uh, like a Batman movie where they have the characters, but they're in like a, a totally new plot. Even if you've read all the comic books, you still get to see something new rather than just like a scene for scene, line for line. Re- um, adaptation regurgitation yeah i completely agree with the batman idea and or have david lynch directed i think it's basically like you said s- what the fuck was your name uh rob p like you said rob p i think it's just gonna be miserable softcore porn unless the director takes artistic license and they won't i guarantee it but as for casting can we get chris evans in there just cast <laughs> me and chris evans in the lead roles and uh, uh somebody should ask me who's in what role but <laughs> I'm not telling. Do you do you guys think that we will see the movie? Mm. Do you, I, we may still be doing I this podcast by the I time it comes out. Yeah, I think out. that would be a very special episode. Well, when exactly is it coming out? 2015 oh. now. Right. So we may not. Oh, I don't yeah, know. No. I mean, there are many chapters in these three I mean, books. Yeah, but and we're gonna we're probably gonna do all three books. So hopefully. Uh, if we can uh, keep our interest up. <laughs> One of us uh, wimps out, we can always replace them. If, yeah. if the great nuclear war promised by time traveler John Titor has not occurred in 2015, we will probably see the movie. Good <laughs> I like that. I love John Titor. Next thing from Eskar Gotu. Eskar Gotu. At 5107 in chapter 5, Terry Doom reads a passage that ends with, He cares enough to come rescue me from some mistakenly perceived danger. Has Anna already forgotten what Jose did, or did she really already downplay the assault to the level of nothingness? She forgot because she has a jellyfish brain, but the real answer is that it's downplaying for sure. He gets forgiven in a later chapter, shows up later in the story. I'm not going to divulge the details yet because it's funny. Escargodi. Events and characters cease to exist the moment they are out of eyesight of the reader. <laughs> Anna only remembers because E.L. Jamesbot loaded a specific remembrance program. The book is happening in real time, in the real world, every time someone reads it. But my real answer is downplay. I agree with Charles. <laughs> I think it's definitely kind of thing where I've said this like a million times. Like uh, this is this thing that happens is very problematic, but it it happens to people. Some ladies might downplay it because they you know see it as oh I deserve it because I've been leading him on or I'm drunk and I you know and like she's just like uh it wasn't that big a deal. He it was just you know I it, you know perhaps a reader could interpret that as like something uh one of those society ingrained things that we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier. next question is from mad nam mad nam mad mad nam this mad nam it's it's almost the same backwards and forwards hey there i've been listening to the podcast and i have the question <laughs> Is there any actual bondage in this book or just plain domination and submission? Yes, there is actual bondage in this book and there's even a little bit of pain play. What else is everything? Just do- oh, just yes? Uh like I mean like if if there's actual bondage and a little bit of pain play, what's everything else? Domination and submission, but like fairly vanilla as far as the sex goes. It's like it's definitely like power play. Like mm-hmm. have we all read like the boathouse fuck or whatever? <laughs> he doesn't really do anything. He just kind of is like you're doing this cuz I need it. Like you're not going to come, which is pretty power play. <laughs> Both from what I can guess at this point, he's got ropes and shackles in his room. Uh, and then I was going to ask you if various types of bondage take place if this, in case this person is like really wants to see some bondage. Is there mummification with saran wrap? No, there's not. And I see you listed a lot of like different types of bondage here. Is there a body bag bondage where you get sipped up in a body bag? <laughs> No. Is there a vac suit where no. you are put into like a body bag and then all the air is sucked out? Oh my god. As for the purity of the bondage, 
liking restraint, I guess you call it. What do you call that? Just bondage? Restraint. Yeah, restraint. Yeah. As far as that goes, no, it is pretty, it's pretty straightforward. None of that stuff. <sighs> Sorry to say it. Well, maybe we're just um, being elitist. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Possibly. But still, I mean, come on. From Anonymous. Firstly, what sort of prior knowledge or experience do the three of you have of BDSM? Second, I'm curious if there are any books that you guys consider to get eroticism right. Books that are well-written and not just glorified fanfic. I stumbled across you guys thanks to Rest of Right, and I'm glad that I did. First of all, I want to apologize because my guessing on Ritzy Pray, there were a lot of problems. I had a cold. I completely messed up my audio. My recording device was 4800 hertz, and the recording frequency was 4100, which made me sound like a chipmunk. I had to get someone else to fix it. And then uh, it was just such a train wreck, and then I couldn't stop like laughing and feeling like shit because I was reading Erotica on a video game podcast. <laughs> I have participated in a year-long mentorship program where I learned different techniques every month for a BDSM Can I ask topping. A question: Was it like a formal thing? Like, did you pay for it, or was somebody just like, "I'll take you under my wing"? It was a formal thing. There actually was uh, like a ten, twenty dollars or something. Okay. But yeah, it was just like the community trying to educate people. It was kind of a little bit elitist, um, just because you know, old guard yeah, people. Yeah, of course. Whatever. But I think it kind of has to be that way, and then you can. Yeah. yeah. And I did learn a lot of stuff about a lot of different things. Also, I have done you know private stuff on my own. Learned a lot from that. The second part of that question was like, "What about your erotica?" Like, I don't think I would like erotica specifically like it's got to have some element some like larger plot element like sci-fi or so you like the erotica as like a side dish and i am inclined to agree with that too it's far more exciting it's some kind of like fulfillment because you get invested in the characters for a different reason and exactly then, yeah exactly so i'm reading this series called the administration series again these are all going to be male male romance erotica which takes place in like a future bureaucracy dystopia britain and it's sort of a murder mystery of this guy who's kind of like in uh brazil the doc the main character has a friend who is basically like a torturer for the government so that's the main character and he's like a sociopath he's it's very interesting because you know he's like a, he's a sociopath he's not a good character so he's sort morally. of like a, a walter white type figure <laughs> Yeah, and it's basically him solving this murder, but he's also got this lover who's a, a dude, and they, you know, do bondage stuff. It's, in, it's very interesting as far as character portrayal and uh, murder mystery. Lots of interesting power play. The first book in that series is called uh, Mindfuck. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of copycat books of Fifty Shades of Grey, and I've heard that some of them are actually more well-written than the actual book. You can find them next to Fifty Shades of Grey at like Target and Walmart. It's weird. But you know, you know, you can read reviews and stuff, read samples, find out what you like. Again, the question is, what, what prior knowledge experience. I don't want to be too specific because I don't want to ruin anybody else's life by saying who they are. Um, I was asked to consider being a sub and I've done some things along those lines. Am I Anna in real life? No, I'm not. As of this podcast, I still don't really know how I feel about it. There's a lot of issues there. I made a note of this earlier when you were saying things, how you should always feel like you have the power, the sub should always feel like they have the power. A lot of times, I don't know if everybody's aware of that. That has always, like, very much sat badly with me. It's very difficult because to do it safely, you need to have it so that it can stop anytime. Yeah, you need to have it like that. But you some just... people want to totally disappear into that fantasy. Right and feel like they can't stop it. That would be, and I think oh, so maybe some subs, like they like to get into that subspace where you give up complete control, but like... That administration series actually gets into that oh, a lot cool. where they, they sort of talk about you, oh, you don't want a safe word, do, do you? But then my personal feeling was like, no, I do, I do want a safe word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned before, I used to hang out at a fetish club all the time, not going to go over it again. My advice would be if you're going to get into books or whatever, don't read books first. Why don't you do this? Read more basic informative guides to BDSM to learn more about realistic expectations and all that. Google is your pal. Google is not your friend. Google is your friend, Chad. Google is watching you. Well, maybe at this point. You will get a sense of what it is that you like, hopefully, even just a little bit. So that is my advice. And like I said earlier about erotica, everybody's tastes are so different, so I wouldn't give a recommendation. Looks like someone didn't listen to the first pod, which is totally <laughs> fine. Personally, I don't have any experience at all, I, I think. Um, even I don't remember anymore. <laughs> yes, I have no BDSM XP. I'm level one. No, I'm level zero, and I will never, never, never level up. Oh, my up. God. No! 
<laughs> Random encounters are, just, are frustrating and scary. Uh, this is all RPG terms. I'm aware of that. I never leave my house anymore because a king slime has taken residence lurking, <laughs> lurking outside my front door. Some people are into that. <laughs> Some people are into that. They are, and that's not really BDSM, though. Um, it sort of is. Level zero degradation. Being attacked by king slime? Sure, yeah, getting absorbed. Game over. Game over. <laughs> yeah, I don't really read a lot of erotic fiction, but uh, my recommendation would probably be Anais Nin. I recognize her name, but what does she write? Henry and June. Um, She has a bunch of diaries that were published. Uh, hey, I just, saw, I just saw an anagram that I like. A cad it? flushing pokey torso. Oh, a cad flushing porky torso. A cad shoplifter goon sky. Goon sky. Oh, a uh, cad heftily porks goons. It's, it's enough to name drop the author because then, like our other viewers should they will insert it into the google t- toolbar like i have just now and uh, henry and june is about her torrid affair with henry miller but it was originally <laughs> published as a romantic laugh so next question from hey boots so having to deal with this terrible book are there any good erotic novels you would recommend to quote unquote cleanse the palate afterwards no no we got this question so many times and well they don't know that i blame them anyways so Having to deal with this terrible book, are there any good erotic novels you would recommend to cleanse the palate afterwards? I guess Chad is on the notes is going first. Making everybody wait. The listeners, the podcasters. No, it's fine. We don't have anywhere to be. I found it. Uh, I, I'm, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would recommend, um, as a definite palate cleanser, uh, these are the films I would recommend. Not books. Why would you... Why would you want to read another book after you just finished the book? What is book? What is book? So first of all, I want to address something with this question about a palate cleanser. I will get to my recommendations in a moment. First of all, normally when you have a palate cleanser, it's something different that will clean your palate. Why would you read something that's the same? How would you be able to tell the quality change? This is a stupid question and you are an idiot. No, please edit that out. Whoa. <laughs> No. I'm not gonna. <laughs> oh my gosh, no, please. Oh my gosh. We've already yelled enough at the, at the listeners yeah, about seriously. asking the same question five times. I mean, that was a joke. Our, our relationship with our listeners is to um, both kind of like butter them up and then throw them on the ground. <laughs> Just like That's, any good BDSM uh, relationship. There's a there's a there's a term there's a term for that, and I will not say it because I have no idea what it, what it is. I actually know sure? exactly what it is. No, I know exactly what is it is. Is it in Japanese? It is. I'm not gonna say it. Nope. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, I do. It's tsundere. Oh, it's just, yeah, tsundere. Like, really? That's what that is? I thought that was... Tsun tsun it's tsundere. It, it actually <laughs> refers to like a character arc originally, where like a character is really cold and hard towards a character. She's tsun tsun, and then she's dere dere. <laughs> right, so where's the buttering up and throwing them down? That's like the opposite. It's actually, the, yeah, first you throw them down, then you butter them up. Then you butter them up. It's, that would... That's Yandere. Yeah, that's Yandere. <laughs> Yandere is actually a little bit different. Yandere is actually you become crazy. <laughs> See, we all know this. You don't need to feel ashamed. Uh, I have no idea what an anime is. What is anime? What's what Japanese? What is an anime? Um, so anyway, so hey. Hey, Boots. I was kidding. You're not an idiot. That was a good question. So I would recommend uh, these films. And this is a serious recommendation. There is no sarcasm or irony intended, except for all of it. So I would recommend Shame which has Michael Fassbender, and then some other person who cares. Oh, he's um, so good in that. He's so fucking naked in that movie. <laughs> I've never seen that movie. It's so good. It's really good. But it, it sort of would probably, it'll probably put you off of uh, physical intimacy for a while. Um, oh, uh-oh. I was already off that, so anyway. <laughs> Compliance, which is based on a true story. Oh, so good. Yeah, it's a really good movie. As is I know, and they do, they do note this in the movie, um... It's fictionalized in that they combined a bunch of incidents into one place. So not everything that happens in the movie happened at the same place, but it, all of it pretty much happened. Each of the Killer, which explores the link between sex and violence. Um, so good, but also not that great. Scary. Yeah. Scary. Really hard to watch and has artistic merit. It's hard to say. No one will ever know. And then Audition. Also by the same director. Uh, also so good, but not as good as Each of the Killer. I didn't see any of these movies except Each of the Killer for two seconds. Each of the Killer is a book, though. A manga, I think. Yes, oh, it shit. is. Which I don't know what it is. It was written by the same guy that wrote Crying Freeman. Of course, I've, I, I, can't, I, I can't read manga. Yeah, That's not a real thing. I can't thing, read at so. all. I, I'm not literate. We've been listening to the audiobook this whole time. 
Um, but I honestly don't know what erotic novels you could read as a palate cleanser. Earlier, I recommended Anais Nin, and I stick by that recommendation. She uh, writes really good erotic-like stuff. Her Romana Clef novel, Henry and June, which I also mentioned earlier, which is about her affair with Henry Miller, is very worth reading. Read James Joyce's letters. Yeah, do that. Yeah. I actually yeah. have read those. That's one thing I have, unfortunately, read. <laughs> but then, like, as a palate cleanser... Totally just like something out of left field, like Go Harry Potter. To the store, pick up a normal romance novel yeah. for a very small price. It's probably. I, I don't cleanser. think a, a romance novel would be a palate cleanser. I think a palate cleanser would be perhaps a scientific journal. Well, like, <laughs> let's think here. So, a palate cleanser is usually like something like a mint or a chocolate. Mm -hmm. So, what's the entertainment equivalent? It's like a. I would say Harry Potter. Um, for like... Do some do heroin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would say genre fiction, something like a different genre, like I would definitely hard, say hard world detective not. Yeah. Yeah, mystery would be good. Mystery um, or fantasy. There's also another suggestion that I have, which is let the right one in. It's actually not a palace. That's so good. That's yeah, it is so good. It's a movie, but it's also a book. Um, it's not book is great. extremely sexual. It has sexual elements. It's don't read it. It's not erotica. Don't read it for that reason. It's no. um, kind of like if Twilight was Swedish and really good. It doesn't even shouldn't even be compared to Twilight, really. But anyway, I guess none of us can give serious answers. Maybe we aren't qualified to review this <laughs> I mean, book because we're not. No, I think that makes us very qualified. No, we yes, we're, we're we're specialists in our field, <laughs> yes, but no. we're not specialists in anything else. We have no general knowledge. All right, I'm not even sure how we're getting Next this question? podcast out. <laughs> how are we doing it? Uh, from Jesus Christ. So, as an American male, who's outside the target audience of British-born American subs? Do you, I don't, do you have any idea as to how this book sold as many copies as it did? I thought a BDSM fetish was kind of rare, as is a fetish for shitty want to be smut. I mean, if you wanted the sexual tension as writhe as it has been in 50 Sade's thus far, you could open a book of murder she wrote. Thank you for your question, Kanye. Um, I, I feel like Yeezy made this question grammatically <laughs> strange on purpose to fuck with us. <laughs> Does somebody want to read the mistakes? Okay, uh, comma crime. As an American male, bad comma, who's outside target audience of uh, of British-born American subs, error, all characters in book are, as well as podcasters, are American. The author has never left England. I thought a BDSM fetish was kind of rare. Does that need a question mark? Want to be should be rendered as wannabe, followed by illegal comma splice. <laughs> the sexual tension as writhing. As in, like, writhing, <laughs> like, squirming. Maybe Not that's rife. what it, squirming with sexual tension. <laughs> uh, Fifty Shades, like the musician Shade, yeah. pronounced Shades <laughs> of Grey, and I would I would read that book. Fifty Shades, Marquis de Sade. Well, is... that would be pretty terrible too, since that's not how you pronounce it. Yeah, name. it would be equally as ter terrible, <laughs> yeah. but it would make more sense. It would. My real answer is this. BDSM fetishes are not that rare, especially depending on what you define as BDSM. Most couples will incorporate some kind of power play or light bondage in the bedroom within their sexual lifetimes. I don't have the citation for this, but I believe it's come up somewhere. Somebody somebody validate me. Just because this book is shitty or wannabe does not disqualify it as smut or something that could turn someone else on with their corresponding fetishes. Haha. <laughs> I would say that uh, the radical feminist argument, all sex, all heterosexual sex is BDSM is rape. and rape. Oh, it's it's all BDSM and rape. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because there's a power imbalance. <laughs> Whenever you're in agree. Patri <clears throat> patriarchy, everything is gendered and you will never escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Honestly, regarding high book sales, uh, like this book is completely boring, terrible middle of the ground. It's not actually, at least as far as I've seen, because I haven't finished reading the book, there's no real erotic tension, like it's not erotically charged. It's really more of like a co-option of BDSM. And I've like, from what Cherry Doom has said, that's kind of how people feel. Sort of a person who doesn't have any real experience with it, like her idea of what it is. Um, it's probably not the most like interesting or really realistic sort of thing. And it just has absolutely awful prose. So it's in like the vein of books that are like, incredibly popular and sold really well, like um, The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, The Kite Runner by Some Guy, um, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Stieg Larsson, and this book, Fifty Shades of Grey, and Twilight. Are you putting all those books in the same quality camp? I sure am. I've never, I have not read any except Fifty for Shades Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey is lower quality than all of them, but all of them are not great. Okay. The Girl with the Dragon Here, Tattoo is atrocious. I would rank it like um, Da Vinci Code at the bottom. 
Fifty Shades of Grey is next. Then oh, really? Have... I put Fifty Shades of Grey below the Da Vinci Code because Da Vinci Code. I actually has... don't because it was so terrible. <laughs> it has it has such a like formulaic boilerplate thriller plot that it can at least be entertaining if you're willing to like turn your brain off. I feel um, so far Fifty Shades of Grey has like there's not even a plot to Fifty Shades of Grey. There's no. nothing like. Well, there's there, no there's sort of is. I think the second book gets a little bit more. The, 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 the first book, like. You can't you can't say you have to get through the first book to get to oh, the I interesting suppose, part. I suppose you're right when you put it that way. And yet, I still had a worse time reading the Da Vinci Code because I really cannot stand those thriller like stereotypes, like the th- like just the romance of it's the Da Vinci Code and the bad. romance of Fifty Shades of Grey. The romance of Fifty Shades of Grey is actually better. You can it's quote me pretty. On that. Da Vinci Code is pretty bad. I agree. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> it is like a '50s like dime store novel plot, but like dressed up to be pseudo intellectual and um just anyway we're not here to talk about other books also never read the never read the girl with the dragon tattoo that book is terrible i actually it's, was gonna rank that the best out of um all these books i agree it is the best out of all of them but it's still terrible it's pretty bad i, I liked i liked reading it that was that was something where i turned my brain off and i enjoyed it all right next <laughs> question from the myriad truths do you three look forward to timing up tuesdays in 50 shades or do re- or do resent them <laughs> Um, I don't know what this is. I looked it up, and that's how I found that terrible article about how to how to do BDSM by a tie. How do BDSM? Uh, from what I can tell, it's something like TMI Tuesday or topless like, Tuesday. Topless Tuesday, maybe, where it's just like an encouraged bondage day with maybe a social media thing. I don't exactly know, um, but I. I can't say that I've looked forward to it because I because I've never heard of it. Uh, but I I suppose I don't see anything bad about it. I guess not. Well, but if they're following the advice of this book, they may be using cable ties and hemp rope. And... E- yeah, no, no hemp rope is good. Oh, uh, but I mean, as far as like not um, stigmatizing it or something, that's good. Yeah, I suppose I agree. Um, again, I I don't know what either of those things are, except Fifty Shades is the book but then why would i look forward to it so it must be a thing maybe they mean the movie the myriad truths explain me that can you please submit another question explaining what those things are because we just don't have enough context and we're not going <laughs> to so google it because we're not a question shit. but an explanation please submit an explanation yes if you submit <laughs> it in the form of a question we probably will not be any clearer um <laughs> you could try we would yeah. ap- applaud your efforts but uh it's true. Anyway. Uh, my thought was that maybe they were just referring to the release of the podcast since that's on Tuesday and then just having to actually read slash notate the book. Like maybe yeah, it's just maybe. a cutesy name. I do look forward to, uh, oh, if Time Me Up Tuesdays. Wow, that's that was a total yeah, coincidence. Yeah, it was a great coincidence if it's something <clears throat> separate, which it probably is. <laughs> well, I, if, the, if you think that we planned that, we didn't. No, we didn't plan that. I just realized it just now. <laughs> Special. But I do look forward to... Um, Notating the book, I think it's fun. Yeah, I have a lot of fun making notes. Me too. I hate the podcast, though. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Um, <laughs> next question is from Anonymous. Oh, boy. Wait a sec. Stop everything. They use the wrong type of who's to ask who's dildo oh. in the picture. <laughs> who is dildo? Who is, who is, who is dildo? Dildos? <laughs> who is dildo is in the picture? Uh. <laughs> but anyway, the question is, who's dildo is in the picture? Uh, that's my that's my dildo. That's my stunt cock. All right, there you have it. Um, next question from anonymous. Uh, possibly spoiler dungeon question. Oh, so here I am. I'm ready. Uh, does anybody <laughs> in the books get injured during BDSMing? Also, as a general question, did anybody of you not trying to be cl- creepy or too close, or do you know anybody that was hurt slash injured during BDSMing? I'm curious what sort of injuries can occur and how you deal with stuff like that or prevent it. Again, I'm not trying to. Creep or ask too close questions. Just curios. Also, what are your bra sizes, including Chad's? Thanks. Um, <laughs> in the book, emotional and all the books because I read all the books. Did you guys know that I read all the books? I read all the mm-hmm. books. Wow. I read all the books. Um, but in the books, yeah, emotional injuries do happen. Bruises happen, but actual injuries like breaking a leg, anything you need to go to the hospital for, does not happen. Um, during this kind of thing, I suppose I've been emotionally hurt. 
just like the people in the book. Um, the things that prevent that, though, is just making sure that you're on the same page and that all aspects of the power play are consensual and that you've talked it out. I can never say the word boundaries enough when talking about this. They're so important. As for bra sizes, my bra size is depressed. Chad is a double D. Cherry Doom does not have a corporeal body, and so the concept of a cup size does not apply. And now here I'm going to tell some stories about my co corporeal body. I haven't had any injuries, uh, like maybe some rope marks that have been appeared on some people and on myself. Uh, I wouldn't consider those injuries. In fact, I was kind of proud of them. As for unintentional stuff, one time I... Woo, woo, trigger warning, trigger warning. I'm about to talk about needles, as in hypodermic needles on the end of a syringe. Whoop, whoop, trigger warning. Blood. Don't listen. Yeah, don't. Uh, if you don't like blood, blood, don't blood like needles. Blood, Skip ahead. Blood. Skip ahead. Trigger warning. But yeah, need um, I do play piercing uh, needle play. It's one of my very favorite things to do. Basically, you just kind of poke a needle into the skin and then like kind of just skim the surface and poke it back out again. <laughs> Can make pretty designs and stuff. Once uh, I was doing it in a sensitive area and it hit a, a, a vein, and uh, a little more blood came out than I anticipated. <laughs> uh, you know, some paper towels and some alcohol cleaned it, cleaned it right up. Some pressure. Yeah. No big deal. No biggie. The one time, um, the way I learned is very like you do these very specific methods of pulling the needle out of the cap, putting it back in and putting it into the sharps container. One time I was not following proper procedure because I was dumb and after I had taken the needle out of the person I put it through the wrong size cap. The cap was shorter than the needle and like jammed it right through the cap into my finger. Ah! Ow. Through my through my glove uh, and I made sure that my my friend did not have hepatitis or anything was tested uh, about a month later, and I'm fine. Good. Glad to hear it. And one of the few times I allowed myself to be tied up, uh, some asshole who I did not like, this was at a party, like, just, like, came into the scene and started, like, hitting me and stuff, which I had Whoa. not agreed to at all. Whoa. I had just agreed to be tied up, nothing else. Yeah, that wasn't cool at all. That and, is completely terrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that's it. There weren't uh, no, like serious injuries or anything, but there were definite panic moments. Yeah, I am definitely with you on the panic moments thing. That is more the sort of thing that will come up, at least in my opinion. It's more of like the mental uh, strain than the physical, unless you're doing uh, things like needle play or whatever. And like even then, like an injury is an injury for most people. Yeah. yeah. There another panic moment I can do is I bought a set of really cheap thumb cuffs, which are just uh, these metal cuffs that just kind of clamp around your thumbs and very uncomfortable, but you can still like use your hands sort of. Okay. Like, it's it's like handcuffs, but your hands are closer together and it's just more awkward. But I bought these really cheap pair and when I locked them on, I I tested them before and I noticed that one of the locks was pretty like sticky, like it was very tough to get it open. Mm. But I locked it on anyway, and then I was like, "Hmm, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> these might be hard to get off." Uh -oh. <laughs> Luckily, after a couple minutes of uh, jamming the key in there, we got we got them off. That's that's good that you <laughs> yeah. avoided it. it. Mostly just like, oh no, how am I gonna? <laughs> the, and, and the other thing is like, if you get injured, uh, you know, you gotta explain that maybe to. To uh, depending on the injury, medical though, professional. Yeah, some some of them can be explained away pretty easily. Like but, you to know. use the example of needles again, um, that could be easy. But then something like maybe something in your butt. I don't know. Like it's like oh, I tripped and fell over. <laughs> like what do you say? <laughs> you can't really say anything. One in a million. One in a million. Duck. Next question is from another anonymous, or maybe the same one. Don't know. Uh, you guys got to complain about too much grammar talk. So no, I'm complaining about that. Complain about too much grammar talk. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy that aspect of the podcast because it shows objectively just how bad the book is. Talking about the crap characterization and narrative can often be taken as subjective opinions, but the grammar comes across as a more objective slash definite bad thing. Also, I hate grammar, but I enjoy listening to you guys talking about it. I'm also no English major. Well, Anonymous, we made an effort to leave in some grammar talk. At this point of the podcast, um, I hope you're satisfied as of this recording. Um... The loser complainer, just kidding, had a point. You can't go over every grammatical mistake or else we would just be talking for like more than the hour plus we usually record. But in any case, thank you for enjoying the podcast. It was very nice. Yes, yeah. thank you. So we have one more bonus question. Uh, <laughs> boop, boop, boop. 
We got this question between recording the first and second parts of this podcast. Okay, so the question is this. Could you recommend some BDSM-based literature that offers better insight into the subculture? I want you to compare Fifty Shades to something not shit. And we are going to answer this question because it's asking us to... That is something for offering insight, not simply like, what is your erotic recommendation, which we've got many questions of. So with that said... I can offer some nonfiction recommendation stuff because I read a lot of books. Uh, CBT manual, cockball torture, called The Family Jewels. Uh, <laughs> it's good. SM 101 is a good, very good beginner's book, very comprehensive. Uh, but the author is kind of stick in the mud about stuff like breath play. It's like, you know, never do it ever. Wait, we have to talk about that. I agree. It can be dangerous. And well, there's like there's a way to do it that doesn't actually. It's just the illusion of breath play, where you pinch the nose or whatever. Yeah, the carotid. no, I'm not talking the carotid. No, then yeah, I don't do that. I don't either. do Yeah, that is dangerous. Don't fucking cut off blood flow. Um, I think that they're fake in good ways to do it, but that is not one of them. The Mistress Manual is like a femdom intro. Femdom means female dominance, but it's very outdated. Like it talks about finding your submissive by putting ads in the newspaper. Which is silly. A very good set of books called The New Topping Book and The New Bottoming Book, which is good because there are not a lot of books about uh, being submissive. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Curious <laughs> BDSM for Beginners. You read Fifty Shades of Grey. Now let America's favorite 50 SOG coach and BDSM expert teach you how to safely try it yourself. Kindle edition. Lol. <laughs> I love that. That's gross. And then there's also, when I was searching, I was just searching Amazon for BDSM, and the first book that came up is called Fifty Shades of BDSM. Melita has lived a charmed life, raised and sheltered by her family and romance by her best friend Liam through the, her teen years. Her world is turned upside down when she's sent to New York to meet the man she has been promised to, handsome multi-billionaire Jack Kemble. Leaving behind everything she's ever known for a man she's never met proves to be more challenging than Melita could have imagined, especially when Jack requests that she spend a week at a BDSM school in California. That... That sounds more fun hmm. than this book. I might get that. It's free. Oh, it's free? Ooh. I'm going to buy that right now. Uh, my suggestion is um, the Chronicles of Gore series. Welcome to a world of gore. <laughs> G-O-R. G-O-R. Uh, don't ever, don't actually, that was a, that was a joke suggestion. Um, to, to... More like garbage. <laughs> um, so gore is basically like this very strange concept of like, men are... Men are made to be dominant, yeah. women are made to be submissive. Right, and so a man can have um, and all that shit. pretty shitty because they have the coolest looking collars. They're like just metal circles, but they like the connotation is just uh, yeah. maybe we can talk about gore later. Or I would love to compare how gore matches up to Fifty Shades of Grey, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, my real suggestion, though, I feel like I saw some good YouTube documentaries, but inevitably a lot of these documentaries will focus on very eccentric people. Like I mean, and I'm I'm not saying that BDSM is eccentric, like maybe for vanilla people but like they they focus on especially strange people because they want to hype up like the documentary or try to make it seem like people who do this have mental problems so i guess my answer is really just like no i can't recommend anything and fuck you <laughs> <laughs> what documentaries do you have anything more specific i can't remember the title but there's one about this guy in england who was like a pro dom not uh -huh. with an E, just a dom, pro dom, and he would he would beat up people in his basement, and they and he would go like very far with it, like uh, contractually, of course, and all. But and then focus kind of on his early life, and he was um, pretty badly abused. But it just kind of went into like his lifestyle, like the things he had to do, how he looked at himself. Look around on Amazon, maybe look around uh, for maybe a site that is uh, better at. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day we'll come up with some more suggestions. Well, once again, um, some of the Fifty Shades of Grey copycat books sound like they might be at least better written and maybe even kinkier. So Perhaps. Check, yeah. out. check out Amazon, check out reviews, and see what you think you may like. So that's it, I guess. That's it! That's our meta episode, and please send us more questions. We love it. I love yeah. it. I love questions. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Oof. See you next Tuesday, Tuesday. for chapter, chapter seven. seven. Woo!